In this lecture, I'll provide you with an outline of methods and approaches in cultural anthropology. One of the things to consider in any scientific discipline, or any discipline as a whole, or indeed in university studies as a whole, is different ways of knowing, and um, the difference in science versus myth in terms of approaches to understanding the human condition. And uh, in anthropology, there have been three major approaches to cultural anthropology over the last 120 years or so. The positivist approach, the reflexive approach, and the multi-sided approach. I'll conclude the lecture here with a discussion on the effects of research on cultural anthropologists. Uh, a good framing question to think about overall is what is science? What can science actually explain? And are there certain disciplines that are inherently more scientific than others? At the same time, we might consider what myth is and what myth can explain, and which, science or myth, uh, if either, will provide a more satisfactory approach for the individual in terms of the types of questions that they're asking about the larger world around them. In an uh, overview of ethnographic work, uh, we can think about the disciplines of uh, increasingly, at university settings, there has been calls for both multidisciplinary work as well as interdisciplinary work. And indeed, in confronting global problems, global issues, world problems, this becomes really key in trying to confront these. And this is one of the things that I'll try to convey over the course of the class, that you have social scientists, those working in the humanities and the arts, as well as what we might consider to be harder sciences, such as chemistry, uh, physics, and mathematics, uh, working together in order to confront contemporary world problems. There are common elements, of course, in any line of inquiry that make um, these both scientific in terms of hard and so-called so hard and soft science. Scientific research has expanded to include more than one way of producing accurate data. The three main approaches to ethnographic fieldwork in the early 20th century have been the positive, reflexive, and multi-sided approach. I'll talk about each one of these in turn. If we think about science as a whole, um, most of us, I think, would point to this notion of positivism. Um, the scientific method, you go out and you form a hypothesis based on uh, the issues, based on the literature review, and then you make some observations, you conduct an experiment, you will then organize, analyze the data, uh, and then report on your results uh, after you draw conclusions from that. Uh, in ideal world, that would tie back into the larger amount of scientific information and would be readily accessible by all scientists, but indeed with uh, both military applications as well as corporate applications and, and use of science, we see that not all the information will be put into general use as a whole. Uh, and this also concerns the issue of property rights and intellectual property rights. So the issue of positivism goes to the question is of, uh, is there a reality that's out there? Um, and positivists would say yes, and that reality can be known through the senses. And particularly in our society, we rely on the, uh, the sense of sight, of vision. Uh, positivism adheres to the notion that there's a single appropriate set of scientific methods for investigating that reality. Um, so what I went through before, um, defining a, a problem, forming a hypothesis, testing, uh, and then reporting on the results. The commitment of the positivist approach is to explain how the material world works, and scientific methodology seeks to separate facts from values. Uh, positivists would uh, be drawn to the notion that there is a single scientific method for all domains of reality, and that all scientific knowledge can be, uh, and will often be, unified. The key here is the protection of so-called objective knowledge, knowledge about reality that is true for all people in all times and, and places. And this idea of objectivity in the context of science, we saw in the last lecture that uh, in some instances you can have um, the, the ideas of the time period very much influencing how scientists were thinking. And another example of this in the cultural field is the idea of unilineal evolution. And unilateral evolutionists fundamentally believe that their society, or another society yet to come, was at the pinnacle, and uh, other societies were uh, inferior to uh, the society within which they were living. Um, some of these individuals include Herbert Spencer, who was interested in the notion of evolution as a whole, and he is indeed responsible for the notion of survival of fittest, which was later attributed to Charles Darwin.
Lewis Henry Morgan in Ancient Society in 1877 looked at the evolution of human society from primeval times all the way up to the Victorian era, which he considered to be the high point of human civilization. Tyler, on the other hand, looked at religion and the various um, ways of uh, worship in terms of animism, uh, which he saw as the lowest form, polytheism, and then enlightened monotheism. Anthropology has often been implicated in the colonial sphere, and functionalists uh, from England were certainly involved in this as well as European powers as a whole. Um, a lot of this school of thought revolved around European colonial possess possessions such as the Trobian Islands, India, Australia, and East, and East Africa. And the function of cultural institutions in relation to the maintenance of, the, of social order and the smooth working of society. Two main schools of functionalism were Malinowski's psychological functionalism and Radcliffe Brown's uh, structural functionalism. In the United States, we have uh, Franz Boas, who did much of the work and influenced many of the scholars in American anthropology. He is one of the individuals responsible for the first notion of cultural relativism. The idea of a cultured individual is merely relative, and that of a person's worth should be judged by his education of the heart. This quality is present or absent here among the es amongst, amongst the Eskimo, as, uh, just as among us. Uh, again, he influenced many anthropologists, including uh, those who didn't always necessarily agree with his approach. And two of those individuals were Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict, who worked with the Culture and Personality School. And they looked at bringing psychology into study of anthropology, um, and Boaz was very much against this idea with historical uh, particularism. And so uh, both um, Benedict as well as Mead uh, looked at culture and personality, looked at how culture would shape uh, personality as a whole. The uh, positivist approach uh, has been critiqued. Uh, Mead attempted to utilize this in a range of societies to look at different gender roles. Uh, but the critique came from uh, other anthropologists as well as those outside the discipline who noted that a lot of what had been uh, framed as positivist research in science and anthropology was in fact, unscientific in nature. And uh, cognitive anthropologists and ethnoscientists were really interested in doing things like eliciting domains, uh, getting individuals' sense of a particular category or group, such as food or trees or medicines, and how those ideas or how those concepts relate with one another. Um, critics of this school noted that it was a uh, you know, question whether this was in fact possible, noted that within culture there was variation and the difficulty of cross-cultural comparison with using ethno-scientific and cognitive uh, anthropological methods. Some of the other critiques of positivism uh, point to the fact that many early positivists frame their research as being both omnipresent and omniscient. That is, the researcher or the anthropologist was everywhere all at once and knew everything about what was going on. More recent accounts, such as Werner's work amongst the Trobrian Islands, uh, Islanders, uh, her main focus was on women, Malinowski's was on men. They produced very different accounts in terms of Trobrian Island society. Uh, and one of the uh, critiques here that comes out of the early work of Malinowski is, is that his focus on men does not necessarily mean that he knew all of what was happening in Trobian society. So having these multiple positions of ethnographers, male and female, studying Trobian society helps to get a larger picture of what's happening overall. Some of the other critiques of positivist approach is that it was insensitive, that it treated people as objects. And the ethnography uh, reads as if it was written by invisible observers. It excludes the close relations uh, that many anthropologists, close personal relations that many anthropologists built uh, over time with people they were working with. And this, again, was part of a larger shift in the politics of research and the ethics of research uh, throughout the 1960s and 70s, where positive science as a whole was questioned, and the relationship between the researcher and the informant uh, became more emphasized, making the role of the researcher more involved and transparent. Um, and so here's where you see the idea of replacing informants with terms like consultants, friends, or people with whom I work. Um, the positivists, for their part, have taken in uh, much of these comments. Um, still, positivist uh, work continues through the work of the National Science Foundation, uh, Lawrence Kunzar's Rationality Wars and the War on Terror, which we'll talk about later uh, in the semester. A lot of this work comes out of the University of Florida uh, and H. Russell Bernard, who's written extensive books on uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, field methods uh, in anthropology.
Um, the counter-argument again comes that field work becomes more of a dialogue between ethnographers and informants, and data is not subjective, but rather is intersect subjective, and that is that understandings come about based on extensive conversations and interactions rather than um, quizzes or tests or these sorts of things, and that intersubjective meanings are shared public symbolic systems of culture overall. And so another school uh, or approach in cultural anthropology has been the reflexive approach. Uh, here you can see a, a picture of uh, Margaret Mead doing an interview. The reflexive approach is how informants think about the intersubjective meanings in their society. And reflexivity as a whole is critically thinking about the way one thinks, reflecting on one's own experience and recognizing that elements of field work uh, depend on positioning. Uh, and, these no and the knowledge that researchers generate is situated. And this comes from Donna Haraway's work. And, uh, and we talked about this a little bit before with Malinowski having access to males, for example, versus Werner, who had more access to females. Another approach in anthropology is the multi-sided approach. And this came about uh, primarily in the 1960s and 70s when anthropologists began to realize that their work in individual communities could not account for every social cultural phenomenon that they were witnessing. And the intent of, of the multi-sided approach in anthropology is to situate cultural knowledge in, the, in relation to a global context. And this comes from Emmanuel Wall Wallerstein's approach in world systems, which took into account uh, the effects of free market economics on different regions of the world, uh, and that no, no, there were no isolates, there were no areas that were completely isolated from global phenomena as a whole. The multi-sided approach relies on archival data positioning the study historically and interpreting existing social structures and practices as transforming and reactive to outside pressures. And Wolf gives the example here of the League of Iroquois, which formed as a new form of social organization as a way to handle uh, multiple European threats, threats from the outside. Some of the drawbacks or critiques of multi-sided fieldwork is that you may lose insights, detailed insights, if, uh, compared to working in one community. Um, you might have split obligations between multiple actors, so uh, any sort of applied program might uh, be called into question, so activism or applied work might be less viable, and there might be some contradictions uh, in cross-cutting commitments. Um, you might have uh, be advocating for the rights of individuals in one area that might have negative impacts on uh, individuals in another area. The counter to these is that multi-sided field work will mainly center on one site and will draw in resources from other sites in order to get a more holistic perspective of the issue under consideration. Now, uh, anthropologists uh, for a long time in the positivist framework remained as the scientists who were doing the observing. But in fact, more recent work, uh, including the work from Dispatches from the Field, uh, which is a text that's been produced by Gardner and Hoffman, uh, and this is Neophyte Ethnographers in a Changing World, uh, that's put out by Wave 1 Press. In it, um, in this 2006 book, many of the authors talk about some of the issues that they actually confront as they become uh, integrated or attempt to become integrated into society um, and some of the difficulties that they face uh, sometimes being integrated into society and generally being accept accepted. So far from Malinowski's or early ethnographers account of the omniscient on the present narrator, um, these accounts become more human in context in terms of having to deal with the uh, issues of uh, of integrating into society as a whole, and ethnographers themselves become people uh, who are considered uh, as part of the study overall. So I hope in this lecture I have given you guys a, a good, solid overview of the different the three main methods or three main approaches in cultural anthropology, as well as some of the schools of thought in cultural anthropology over the last 120 years.